Welcome back friends. Today's film explanation is about a guy who had to spend $82.5 million in 30 days to inherit $825 million with today's inflation. All this from a 1985 film called Brewster's Millions directed by Walter Hill. The film begins with a local baseball match in Hackensack, New Jersey, and on one of the teams, there was this guy Monty, who was the pitcher, and his best friend Spike, who was their catcher, in the field where they were playing, there was a train crossing so, they got a short break, and Monty told Spike about the guy who was taking his pictures for the last three matches. He thought that he was a scout from the big league because it was his dream to play for it. Spike opened up to him to stop dreaming because no scout has ever gone to their hometown. The one thing he promised him was that if they won that match, Spike was going to take him for drinks to get him drunk. They happened to win that match, and Spike took Monty for drinks like he had promised with girls for the players of the team they won. That night as they were having fun, the cameraman who was taking his pictures made a phone call. He updated whoever sent him to spy on Monty on what Monty was doing at that very time. As Monty, Spike and the girls were leaving that bar, the players from the team they won found them with their women. A fight rose up in the bar after one of the ladies told her guy that Monty and Spike tried to pick them up, and the owner called the police for help. Monty and Spike spent the night behind bars, their coach showed up and told them that their team could not pay for their bails and fines. On top of that, they were fired from the team. The next thing they had to face was the judge, and they were found guilty, but luckily enough, the cameraman following Monty acted like their representative and paid off their fines since they had pleaded guilty. From there, the cameraman drove them to the person who had sent him for Monty, and the one thing in his head was that he would be signed in the big baseball league. When they got there, three gentlemen were waiting for him, one was Edward Roundfield, and the other two were lawyers, Mr. George Granville and Mr. Norris Baxter. Edward asked him if he had ever heard of the name Rupert Horn. He was like he had never but bet that he was someone high in the Yankee organization. Edward told him that Horn was his great uncle and told him a brief story of how Horn made his money from scratch in the oil and the real estate industry making him one of the wealthiest men in America and that since he had died, Monty was the sole living heir to all his wealth. From there, they played him the video will of his uncle with the conditions to inherit it. Rupert Horn himself was the man in the video. Monty was surprised that his great uncle was white and yet he was black. Horn explained to him how it came about. That his great grandfather married two times, his first wife was white, and they produced Horn, and the second wife was black. And they produced Monty's grandmother. Horn told Monty that he was the only relative he was left with so, to inherit his wealth. He told him a story first about his great grandfather. That one day he caught Horn with a cigar and as punishment. He locked him in a room for three days with no food or water but only a box of cigars and a box of matches. He refused to let him out until all of the cigars were done with no one to help him because he had no friends. This was the very thing he was going to do to Monty. He was going to teach him how to hate spending by giving him $30 million, which is, due to inflation today, $82.5 million to spend in 30 days to get $300 million equivalent to $825 million today without buying any assets, no investing, no cars, no jewelry, no houses. He was allowed to hire and pay anyone who gave him value for his service, he was allowed to donate 5% to charity, gamble 5%, but he was not allowed to give away money for free like buying a Hope Diamond as someone's birthday present or buying expensive paints, and use them as fire, he was not supposed to destroy what was inherently valuable, and he was not supposed to tell anyone why he was spending the money. In case he had doubts that he won't be able to spend it in 30 days, Horn had spared him $1 million, which is equivalent today to $2.7 million because if he failed to spend the $30 million in 30 days, he would not inherit anything. The lawyers were pushing him into taking the $1 million because if he did, it was them to control the $300 million. But he took his chance to spend the $30 million, Edward's job was to observe to make sure that everything was fair. They assigned him an accountant called Mrs. Drake to account for his spending and from there he took Monty to show him that the cash was real. Just know the guy was very excited that he could not even talk but stumble. When they reached the bank vault and confirmed that the money was there. Straight away, he hired the cameraman who looked for him as his official photographer with a pay of $10,000 a week, denied the interest rate that bank was offering him of 24% making $7.2 million a year, hired the security guard there who was making $350 a week before taxes with an offer of $4,000, to be the head of his security and told him to get 20 more goods at $3,000 a week. He ordered him to get $3 million from the vault and follow him. Spike tried to advise him on what he was trying to do because he didn't even know the guys he hired, not knowing that Monty's goal was spending. 
when he made a phone call to his baseball coach telling him that he had just inherited $30 million and that he was going to rent the team for 30 days and make sure they played the New York Yankees. The coach didn't take him seriously because they all knew how broke he was and he was probably calling from jail for his previous damages. So, he hang off him. Because of the security around him, people wanted to know who he was, and the cameraman was like he was Monty Brewster, the wealthiest guy in the world though he wasn't. He stopped an abrupt taxi driver and assigned him as his driver offering him $5,000 a week. Because the taxi was crap, the taxi driver questioned his integrity, and Mrs. Drake was like, for that kind of money, he could hire a fleet of limousines. Still, he gave that assignment to the taxi driver to hire him three of the most expensive limousines with expensive drivers too, and give the receipts to Mrs. Drake. From there, he called whoever wanted for lunch, people followed him to the most expensive hotel around, bought each lunch with the most expensive bottle of wine called Chateau Lafite 1961 at $400 bottle. He tried to persuade Mrs. Drake into hiring someone who could do the books as he spends more time with her, but she was playing hard to get like most women do saying she had a fiancé who was a lawyer. Monty was like he would love to meet her husband someday and pay for his time if possible. And Mrs. Drake was like her husband Warren was a very busy man that she even bet if he could buy him. Because of what Monty was doing, it attracted news people, and they were all over him on one of the interviews. He said he was hiring people of different talents because he wanted to give everyone a chance and that his friend Spike, his senior vice president was that one in charge of that. He went to a five-star hotel in Midtown Manhattan called the Plaza Hotel and rented it for 30 days at a fee of $1 million. The manager, Mr. Carter, had no choice but to accept his offer even though he had bookings that were worth $100,000 a week. He hired personal designers to do his wardrobe. Mrs. Drake's husband Warren came over to pick off Mrs. Drake for the foundation that they were heading to. Only to offer him $100,000, this shocked Warren because he did not expect it. And he cancelled his appointment right away. Drake was disappointed because she said that her fiancé couldn't be bought. To make matters worse, after Warren talked about the interior design of the suite they were in, Monty was surprised that he knew much about this kind of stuff. Warren told him that his ex-wife Marilyn was a decorator, and that's was how he got to know much. Monty then asked him to help him redecorate his offices at a fee of $250,000, much money than Warren had ever worked for and he said yes, even though he was a lawyer and not a decorator. He also offered to pay $100,000 to Marilyn his ex to help out with decoration. He told Mrs. Drake that by doing this, she would get a chance to see her fiancé every day by this way even though she was not happy about the whole idea, because it meant that they had to postpone their honeymoon. Surprisingly, Warren was working for the same lawyers who were on Monty's case and wanted him to fail so that they could take the $300 million. And when he told them that he wanted a month off so that he could be Monty's interior decorator, they used this to their advantage. They asked him to be their eyes and ears with Monty's spending. Because he had hired the whole hotel, he had made his offices in there too, he got the chance to meet with Marilyn. She told him her ideas, and he welcomed them. As he was leaving with Mrs. Drake to his main office, Marilyn called on Mrs. Drake and told her that as her wedding gift, she was going to decorate her apartment for free, people were all over Monty with their ideas, everyone wanted to get a chance to get listened to, and he was giving them money to work on those ideas. His coach Charlie called, and Monty was excited about the plans he had made with their baseball team to play with the Yankees as an exhibition. The coach wanted to get the players on the bus to New York, but Monty told him not to bother and guess what? He hired choppers to transport them from where they were to their practice, they were welcomed like heroes in the new uniforms he bought them. What confused the coach was that the practice field was on Long Island, where the choppers had picked them up to where they found him, and they were going to take a bus back to Long Island, for the lawyers, they were somewhere monitoring him, and one of them was like they underestimated him. That night, Spike had got an investor for Monty, but he had a woman with him so, he used Mrs. Drake to get to him because he had a thing for her and could not say no to her so, he came up with an excuse to get rid of the woman he was with only to realize that they had bought him an investor, who wanted 15% off any profit he makes from his ideas. Still the same night, as Monty and Spike were having some fun time as friends practicing baseball in his suite, Spike advised Monty to forget about Mrs. Drake, that she was a terrible investment and that Eugene, the investment guy, had helped him out with his investment ideas like precious metals, rare coins, old stamps and so on. Monty got an idea from the conversation and from there, he went and bought an old stamp for $1.5 million, the most expensive stamp ever sold that time. He mailed it on a postcard to the lawyers inviting them to the baseball game, they were surprised at how smart he was. And because of this, they had to execute plan B, which was Warren Cox. They gave Cox an assignment to make Monty make an error in his accounting, and this way, Cox was going to be made partner. 
The problem he had was that the people he gave money, thinking that they would lose it were instead making him profits like the guy he gave to bet made him a million in dollars. And so he donated it to charity, the guy he gave to invest in icebergs. The stocks increased from $1 to $9.50, and so he told them to sell the stocks. His friends were wondering what was wrong with him because whenever he made money, he was sad and when he lost money he was happy. The reason he gave Mrs. Drake was that he cannot get used to being rich though he was making millions, but she didn't understand what he meant. As they were going for lunch, he surprised Mrs. Drake with $125,000 car. A guy knocked them from behind and instead of the guy paying, Monty paid the $300,000 for damages. This pissed off Mrs. Drake saying that Monty was showing off. Cox saw them from Monty's suite they were working on he felt jealous because they acted like lovers. And this gave him another reason to destroy Monty with Mary Line spicing up the situation to make Cox jealous. That evening in some hotel. He paid $600,000 for French wine that was 114 years old with $10,000 a bottle, and he gave it out to people to drink. Mrs. Drake changed her feeling toward her fiancé Cox, and this made him more jealous. But the excuse she gave was that it was the job giving her hard time which was hard for Cox to believe. To make matters worse, his friend Spike and the finance guy made him $10 million. Spike was happy about the achievement he had made him. This was a shock to Monty because he was then right back from where he had started. He asked them for some time alone, and they didn't get it why he was acting that way. Luckily, this is when he saw on TV that New York was going for city mayor elections. Because election campaigns can mean to be expensive, he got the idea to become one of the contenders for the position of mayor of New York. He used the rest of the money in campaign buying people's votes and asking them to vote for none of the contenders. His team got a chance to play with the Yankees, though they lost the match, and after. He declined the mayor position because people had voted for him leaving New York without one, for Cox. He made a refund for something he was assigned to get worth $20,000 to fail Monty as the match was still going on. That night, Monty used the $38,000 he was left with to throw a big party for his team even though they had lost. To cut a long story short, on the last day, Monty thought that he had spent everything, only for Cox to show up with $20,000 as a refund in the last minutes. He had given up and going to sign $300 million to the lawyers. Cox told Mrs. Drake about what was going on, and she went in to save him. Cox picked up a fight with him for snatching Mrs. Drake's and when he talked about suing him, he got the idea to hiring Mrs. Drake as his lawyer in the last two minutes, and she wrote him a receipt. This is how he managed to inherit $300 million, and the lawyers were in big trouble for fraud. Thanks for watching, and consider subscribing now now now.